Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Aicha Chubukchu. I'm assistant professor in human rights at the London School of Economics and Political Science. On behalf of LSE Human Rights and the Department of Law, I'm delighted to welcome you to the school tonight and our, introduce our speaker, Professor Samuel Moyne. Professor Moyne's talk this evening is the fifth annual lecture organized by the Internationalism, Cosmopolitanism, and the Politics of Solidarity Research Group that I convene at LSE. As some of you will remember, Professor Buck Morse of the City University of New York delivered our annual lecture last, last year <clears throat> on the theme of global civil war. Professor Moyne's talk tonight, Human Rights in the Neoliberal Maelstrom, draws on his forthcoming book, Not Enough, Human Rights in an Unequal World, which will be published in a few months by Harvard University Press, so congratulations, Sam. Having previously taught for many years at Columbia University, then at Harvard University, Professor Moyne currently teaches law and history at Yale. In addition to his book uh, to be out in March or April this year, Professor Moyne is the editor, co-editor, and author of numerous books in the fields of European intellectual history and human rights history, so many, in fact, that I realize he doesn't list them all on his website at Yale. In particular, though, allow me to mention the groundbreaking Last Utopia, Human Rights in History, published by Harvard University Press in 2010, and Christian Human Rights, which is based on the Mellon Distinguished Lectures that Professor Moyne delivered at the University of Pennsylvania in 2014. In addition to being a prolific writer, and I would also call him a public intellectual, Professor Moyne is the co-editor of the Journal of Humanity, as well as of several book series, including the Brandeis Library of Modern Jewish Thought, the Cambridge University Press Human Rights and History series, and the University of Pennsylvania Press Intellectual History of the Modern Age series. That's a brief introduction to a very influential scholar. Now, before we proceed, allow me to note that this evening is being audio and video recorded. Technology permitting, we'll have a podcast of the lecture and the Q&A posted online. So if you'd like to censor yourselves, please do, because this will be in perpetuity, your questions. Audience members are welcome to tweet about the event. The suggested hashtag is LSE Moyne. Tonight, Professor Moyne will lecture not for about an hour, not for about 45 minutes, but probably for about 35 minutes, I was told. So we'll leave plenty of time for the Q&A, prepare your questions. The event will conclude at 8 p.m. It's a tremendous pleasure and honor indeed to welcome to LSE Professor Samuel Moyne, one of the most provocative and generous thinkers that I've had the pleasure of learning from. Thank you very much, and welcome to LSE. Thank you. Um, I'm just hoping that the, the uh, staff comes and uh, puts my slides up. Uh, I'd just like to begin by um, thanking ISA, of course. Uh, uh, I've never formally been a student at this institution, but as you'll see during the talk, I've, I've learned a great deal from an array of the professors myself. Uh, and as I'll mention, one in particular uh, led me to write this book. Uh, kind of unintentionally. Um, I'm going to try to summarize at least a little bit of what I try to say in the book um, uh, for a half hour or maybe a bit more and, and leave time for your questions. So please don't censor yourselves. Um, so I'm going to start in the year 1981 uh, when this woman, who's a playwright uh, named Jdena Tominova, uh, from uh, Czechoslovakia took an extended visit to the West. Uh, she went to Dublin, among other places. She was a critic of her country's repressive political regime. In particular, she was the spokesperson for Charter 77, really one of the very first prominent dissident organizations uh, that, along with a few other uh, kinds of movement, 
uh, really made international human rights activism exciting, um, eventually worldwide. But she surprised her audience uh, in Dublin on that day in 1981. She explained that uh, as a beneficiary of uh, her communist state's policies, she was still grateful to it uh, and remembered and wanted to extend the ideals of her youth, and in particular, its ethic of material equality. All of the sudden, she remembered of the leveling of classes she'd lived through when a young girl. I wasn't underprivileged and I could do anything. Now since then, she forthrightly acknowledged, and especially after the suppression of the Prague Spring uh, reforms in 1968, the scales had fallen from her eyes about what a communist state was. Uh, and she'd learned to denounce the government's oppression. And indeed, for her membership in Charter 77, uh, she'd been beaten on the street and had her head pounded into the pavement. But uh, even when her government uh, suggested she leave for a while to avoid imprisonment, and indeed her citizenship uh, on this trip was revoked, and she never returned home. Uh, she remained true to the socialism that had meant so much to her generation and that of uh, a generations uh, 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 like hers and earlier, not just in Western Europe, but around the world. I think that if this world has a future, she explained to her Irish audience, it's as a socialist society, which I understand, to mean a society where nobody has priorities just because he happens to come from a rich family. And furthermore, this socialism wasn't supposed to be just a local idea or a modular one achieved state by state. The world of social justice for all people has to come about, she added. So she was clear at this moment in 1981 that socialism couldn't provide an alibi as it sometimes had for the deprivation of basic human rights. Uh, but by the same token, uh, for her nation or for the world, the newer interest in human rights couldn't serve an, as, as an excuse to abandon material equality. Now back then, uh, between the founding of Charter 77 and 1981 when she gave this talk. The whole rhetoric of human rights and especially international human rights was newly prominent. Uh, and yet, uh, its career as a transnational language of concern and identification has not coincided with uh, the progress of the socialist ideal. Instead, it's accompanied neoliberal policies, both within nations and on the world stage. So decades later, Tominova's speech looks ironic. This is data uh, from a Google engram. Uh, it measures the prominence or salience of words, names, and phrases in many languages. Uh, and this is based on English language books, but all the languages it tests generate this same chart. Until the late 20th century, people were overwhelmingly more likely to utter the word socialism than the phrase human rights. Until the one began to decrease and the other to spike, precisely when Charter 77 was founded. You'll note there common inflection point right in the late 70s. You'll note that the lines of their relative popularity cross precisely when the Cold War ended in 1989. And uh, now we have human rights centers and talks. Uh, moral globalization occurred thanks to human rights, uh, you might say, but the bigger phenomenon has been economic globalization and the death of socialism, which in real terms sounded the death knell for material equality in most places. So it's hard to avoid the verdict. 
that the increasing success of human rights as our highest moral language came about in the age of the victory of the rich. Few in the 1970s could have anticipated such a thing, the neoliberal age in which we've lived. But 40 years on, it does seem pressing to reassess how human rights fit uh, with a larger sense of distributive ethics and with the concrete political economy of their own age of at least rhetorical ascendancy. In many nations, welfare states have entered crisis. Globally, in the 1970s, there was a proposal to create a welfare world, uh, but uh, that new international economic order that the global south demanded uh, was beaten or failed, depending on who you asked, and um, market fundamentalism under new kinds of uh, macroeconomic governance nationally and globally won instead. As a result, famously, inequality has exploded in many nations, most, although the globe has become slightly more equal by some measurements. Human rights then have enjoyed increasing prominence in our neoliberal age. They broke out into mass visibility in the 1970s when neoliberalism experienced its first breakthroughs, and they ascended in common to something like consensus public philosophies, the one in worldwide ethics, the other in uh, economics uh, in the 1990s. The striking correspondence between the two naturally raises the question of their relation to each other. Why was Tominova proved so wrong, you might ask? Is there any way, if you wanted to do so, to revive her vision? So uh, this is inequality in your country and mine. If you uh, think about where human rights came from, you might tell the following story. Of course, it's true that the basic premise of human rights, a moral one that individuals have non-negotiable entitlements, stretches back centuries. No one, to the best of my knowledge, has ever doubted it. But the truth is that the unique visibility of human rights as a supranational language of justice in our time had few precedents. After all, the original purpose of rights claims, when they move from moral philosophy books into the political explosion we know as the Atlantic revolutions of the late 18th century was to justify sovereignty and violence to achieve it. The original human rights movements were for the sake of sovereign states and usually nation states. Uh, and they engaged in violent activism, at least in the initial stage of winning freedom for the sake of a citizenship space rather than informational shaming. And in fact, if we track the fortunes of the concept of human rights for a long time, it remained, when used at all, uh, connected to the politics of uh, citizenship spaces. And that remained true as late as the 1940s, when even after the Holocaust, most people around the world still needed and wanted citizenship uh, uh, for their own peoples. Uh, and that, of course, included the Jews. Uh, and for many people, like the Americans back in the late 18th century, outside an empire, and very often the British one. The global empires against the likes of which Americans had originally revolted in the name of human rights were still going strong in the 1940s. And most humans were still willing to engage in violence to achieve freedom as the wars of decolonization would show. The United Nations passed a Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, but for a long time it was barely noticed. Now, things were very different in Tominova's uh, middle age, 30 years later, when human rights, thanks to her and other activists, became a mantra of transnational movements, primarily associated with a new kind of supranational concern. 
a language not so much or at least not only for the, uh, uh, to talk about the nature of local solidarity in bargains over the uh, extent and content of citizenship, but instead uh, to talk about the basic freedom and, and sometimes bare survival of humans globally. Likewise, mobilizationally, human rights mobilization increasingly uh, abjured violence and revolution. Instead, uh, it focused much more frequently on inter informational politics of naming and shaming, and as lawyers got in the act, new kinds of legal activism. There's no doubt that a new cosmopolitanism surged, but it was in an increasingly liberal, neoliberal time. Now, I've just summarized a book uh, I once wrote on the history of human rights. Uh, and in retrospect, I've realized that I failed to mention distributional ethics much, uh, and I omitted political economy. And now that looks to me to be short-sighted. Uh, 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 so I've written a new book. <laughs> you know, uh, George Orwell is once reported to have been asked uh, why he seemed to be changing his mind or at least saying something new. And he uh, replied, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do? Uh, but the truth is, I don't think the facts have changed very much uh, in the past 10 years. Uh, the main reason I've I've, I've thought about this topic is because your colleague here, LSE professor Susan Marks, wrote just a few paragraphs about this old book pointing out that uh, it omitted uh, distribution and uh, economy. And uh, it struck me in, in the barrage of, of criticism that I had gotten to be uh, something that, that was a, a a fingered a, a grievous mistake that I made. So I've been thinking about how could I rectify it. I'm not changing my mind so much as trying to enrich uh, what I've said before, but I, I, I'll, I'll invite you to, to, if you know the old work, to see whether this goes uh, in a radically different direction. Now from this perspective, from the perspective of distribution and economics, the idea of non-negotiable entitlements, uh, uh, although I would defend its relationship to revolution and nationhood, had in the later 19th century especially been strongly linked to classical liberalism and the rule of markets. And in this country and mine in particular, the concept of human rights may have been mainly used in the later 19th century as slogans for defenders of free contracts and inviolable property against, uh, to stave off the coming of the welfare state. So no wonder that already in his youth, Karl Marx could conclude that human rights within bourgeois states might never tr transcend uh, ap apologia for narrow protections um, for the pr for persistence of capitalism. And yet, in the mid 20th century, the welfare state did come. And to the extent they were used, uh, human rights concepts were recast in the spirit of egalitarian aspirations, materially egalitarian ones, at least to some remarkable extent, within discrete national communities. That old UN Universal Declaration in 1948, I would now say was most of all a charter for national welfare in the new age of social citizenship of its time. Just as before in modern history, the notion that individuals have basic rights was undoubtedly uh, affected uh, by the political economy that uh, undoubtedly shapes so much about people's moral ideals, what they think and how they live. Chock full of economic and social rights, the Universal Declaration was a charter for social citizenship, not transnational uh, attention or activism. Uh, uh, at least for those citizens who uh, already had citizenship, or if they were still under empire, could win it by any means necessary. And indeed, we might argue that the reason the Universal Declaration 
according to all our evidence, made so little impact uh, for so many decades is because there were many idioms, uh, including, of course, socialism, for the welfare state uh, and distributive ethics within each national setting. I wouldn't want to claim that human rights primarily justified the innovations of the welfare state, but conversely, the welfare state proved that human rights were flexible to some extent and arguably beyond what Karl Marx himself believed. Uh, with the innovation of economic and social rights, it turned out that human rights were possible to update in a new and more socially conscious and interdependent age. And it was one, according to our measurements, was the most egalitarian age materially uh, in modern circumstances of abundance compared to the 19th century a classical liberal era before and our neoliberal era since. And then human rights were redefined once again in our time. The construction of a new supranational cosmopolitanism in the name of basic individual entitlements occurred alongside the hollowing out of social contracts that had once provided uh, unprecedented material equality. And this in the very nations like this one whose citizens went on to found and fund the most famous human rights movement for the sake of their fellow human beings. You might think of it as a stronger local solidarity getting replaced by a weaker and further flung solidarity in and under the pressure of a neoliberal age. Now what I want to argue about this relationship is that the effect of our neoliberal political economy has mainly been to create a missed opportunity. Uh, the trouble with human rights uh, in our time has been that people came to believe uh, because of false advertising and their own politics of reception that human rights were much more than a modest ethic. Uh, they lacked centrally a more ambitious ethic of material equality alongside the commitments to basic liberties, sometimes subsistence, that they featured. And people uh, came to believe that this modest ethic uh, for activists was going to be up to the challenge of facing down any injustice that occurred in the face of neoliberal victory. So I want to spend a few minutes arguing that in contrast to insisting, uh, as some critics have, that the trouble with human rights is that they caused neoliberalism, at least in some significant sense, or distracted fatally from neoliberalism's victory. I want to make a, a weaker claim, or if you like, it shifts the target of the indictment not to activist communities and a few uh, relatively insignificant lawyers, but rather to the audience for activism, which overestimated the ethical importance and mobilizational power of human rights. So overall, human rights law and politics, if not to blame for contributing to or distracting from neoliberal assumptions and effects, were condemned to a defensive and minor role in pushing back against a new political economy. And the trouble is that for a long time, no one noticed or said so, and then called for something better. Now, as I've mentioned, some have claimed that either the very notion, if this is how you read on the Jewish question by Karl Marx of individual rights, or this latter-day globally-minded contemporary human rights movement, or possibly both, some have claimed that those are condemned if you like, in advance, to work in the service of capitalism. 
I've already suggested that their flexibility, not just in the experience of social welfare states, but also in our neoliberal times, suggest at, at a minimum considerable malleability in the language of human rights, such that they turn out to serve pretty wildly different political economies in very different ways. Um, it may be, you might argue in response, that those are all versions of capitalism. Uh, but assuming that a category itself makes much sense, uh, and without going into much further detail, um, I'd like to suggest that it may be that the concept of human rights is one that we may want to defend um, as, as uh, uh, informing a wide variety of potentially ones we haven't uh, discovered or enacted of, of production and distribution. Uh, and uh, whether within uh, the horizon of something we call capitalism or beyond it, uh, they seem to accompany different visions of political economy, adapting each time, and maybe for an indefinite future. Now, I want to admit that uh, the notion of rights was very marginal to the experience of the welfare state and social citizenship. And, and if I had more time, um, I'd want to argue that one big reason for the exclusions that welfare states involved, especially in terms of gender and race, uh, and when it came to the very poor, is that they very um, rarely allowed for social provision as claimable rights. Uh, even though, in a wave after 1918, constitutions more and more often featured economic and social rights. But I think the bigger lesson, in spite of the marginality of rights talk at the height of welfare states, is that if we look, we find that the rise of pressure for social citizenship proved that the language was much more capable of flexibility than some in the uh, push for the welfare state had believed. I've mentioned Marx, I've mentioned another reformer, uh, J.A. Hobson, who in 1901 already noted, among modern social reformers, there's a tendency to carry the revolt against the theory of natural and inalienable rights of individuals on which 18th century political philosophy was built so far as to deny the utility of recognizing any rights of the individual as a basis for social reform not just those influenced by Marxism, but bourgeois reformers uh, became very skeptical of rights talk in the drive for the welfare state. But by its conclusion, the campaign to establish welfare states um, proved at the very least that rights could be adapted, uh, uh, notably in the coming of the uh, category of social rights, which in spite of uh, the overall marginality of rights in the 40s does, this category of social rights does have a, a, a kind of consecration uh, at that moment. I just mentioned, uh, since I'm here, uh, that uh, it's worth thinking about T.H. Marshall, uh, who uh, undoubtedly in the English language gave the most intellectually prominent uh, 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 reference to social rights in the 40s proper. It's quite amazing that when he gave the Cambridge lectures uh, in January 1949 that formed the basis of his, his famous citizenship and social class, um, he didn't mention the Universal Declaration. I don't believe he knew it happened because it was a rather insignificant event at the moment. Uh, he spoke. And uh, though he used the concept of social rights, uh, uh, it was purely as an event within an, an, a British national story without mentioning not only the British Empire, but the whole world uh, as a potential uh, area of distributional justice. And yet, uh, it's quite critical to see that his understanding of social rights uh, went beyond a dream of sufficient provision 
at least for the white male working classes who were the agents and beneficiaries, at least up to a point, of the mid-century welfare states. He believed that the welfare state would bring about not just sufficient provision or a floor of basic protection in the economic realm, but class moderation. Uh, and a new kind of material equality, which of course occurred. We can debate how it happened, but it did. Uh, and the point I want to make is that uh, he believes social rights were part of, in some mysterious way, uh, a material egalitarian project, anticipating Tominova's beliefs 30 years later. Now if we turn to our neoliberal time to think about this flexibility of human rights under the pressure of new kinds of uh, intellectual worlds and material realities, we must acknowledge that never did the language of human rights revert to the narrow protection of con contract and property. Indeed, the human rights movements in its famous covenants, which came into force in the mid-70s when the human rights phenomenon takes off, uh, a pioneers the first declarations of rights in world history that do not have a property right, and possibly at their very core. No one, I believe, in most languages uses the phrase human rights, as was true in the late 19th century, to prefer primarily to a movement for the freedom of contract and sanctity of property and the victory of the rich. More than this, whatever relationship of the human rights law and movements we know to their neoliberal ambiance, these movements have brought unprecedented scrutiny to a problem the welfare state forgot, not just to state violence globally, but also to the profound failures of local politics to treat citizens equally, uh, no matter their gender, race, religion, or so sexual orientation. And finally, alongside that unprecedented push for status equality in a neoliberal time, uh, human rights movements have also, albeit gingerly, called on the resources that were there in the Universal Declaration for demanding distributive entitlements, economic and social rights from housing to food, struggling to renew some of the premises of, of the social welfare state under the reign of a different political economy. Meanwhile, for all of its sins, and I will turn to indict them momentarily, neoliberalism could sometimes fulfill the wildest dream of human rights activism when it comes to sufficient distribution. Uh, as Chinese marketization brought more human beings out of poverty than any force in history, certainly including the human rights movement itself. So the social welfare state had focused its generosity material egalitarian to some extent on the white male working class. Human rights movements, aside from um, the much greater sense of status equality than welfare states even attempted to guarantee, shifted its attention uh, to the wretched of the earth um, and the problem of sufficient distribution in, in the form of global anti-poverty. However imperfect their successes, uh, uh, when they turn to distributional matters at all. Sufficiency globally matters much more today, sufficient distribution of the most basic entitlements than arguably at any time in history, uh, including under communist governments worldwide. So all that's to say that human rights have been malleable. And in our time, uh, to the extent that they connect with unprecedentedly successful campaigns for status equalization and sufficient provision. Now, I don't want to you know, push this, the sense of some dispute um, too far, especially because it would take us way too far afield into basic issues of social theory. I'll just mention in passing that my work has come out of a, a school in, in the United States known as Critical Legal Studies, which is focused primarily on discourse, 
Uh, meanwhile, in part because of uh, Susan Marks and uh, 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 really in the lead, uh, in other places we have a new kind of uh, um, 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 uh, of Marxism. And I'm trying to experiment with uh, a place in social theory in between these two positions. Neither uh, discourse exclusively, neither material factors exclusively. But of course there are many kinds of of position in between, and of course there are many kinds of Marxism. We could return to this in the questions if you want. Now if we reject, as I've been arguing we must, the notion of congenital defects to the very idea of human rights and accept their flexibility depending on, on ambient folk forces, including material ones, then we need to narrow our inquiry to think about the specific form of market ordering that did triumph since the 70s and what to say um, um, uh, not to exempt human rights from connection and neoliberalism, but to get the connection correct. Uh, because it's true, human rights less and less imply a minor idiom for national welfare. More and more for most speakers and hearers, let alone movements uh, and lawyers, they imply the struggle for basic protection uh, and very often transnational activism. There is this perfect chronological match, the 70s and since. But I want to center the problem of human rights and neoliberalism around the fate of material equality and argue that these have coexisted, neoliberalism and human rights. Human rights didn't set out to pursue material equality, uh, while neoliberalism uh, most definitely moved to destroy it. Now this wasn't, I want to suggest, a matter of collusion or conspiracy, but simple juxtaposition of a selective and weak cause movement, because that's all human rights has been, really, with a very powerful phenomenon in the world, focusing its agenda on new conditions for material hierarchy, which it's certainly brought about by now in most nations. Now, if this is correct, this diff slightly different framing, um, the argument begins with the premise that human rights did not or at most did little to bring the neoliberal age about, in spite of the fact that you might argue the chronology is so close and let's say the basic moral agent, the individual, is the same one. But I would suggest that neoliberals, if we're doing a serious causal analysis of uh, the ascent of their doctrines and policies, conquered the world uh, on their own, under their own power. They neither were in fact helped nor needed help from human rights uh, movements or even ideas. So I want to suggest that we start by recognizing how small a phenomenon human rights has been, even ideologically, uh, and, and compare it to the very big phenomenon of political economic shift through which we've lived. So let me um, try to specify this for a couple of minutes, uh, collapsing a lot of detail, just because I, I, there isn't time. Uh, over the substantial period since this moment of the 1970s in our own time in a very big world which both human rights and neoliberalism may have visited at different times and in different ways. I think we might suppose it's true, as Naomi Klein has alleged, uh, that in this first case of the imposition of neoliberal policy in Chile after the coup in 1973, the human rights movement obscured the economic foundations of authoritarian rule. According to Klein, it merely focused on superficial brutality like disappearance and torture. Or supposing it's true, as I think uh, Marx, Susan Marx has claimed, and quite compellingly, that human rights movements have not been agents of necessary structural transformation. Also true, 
The question is whether we believe seriously that the outcomes would have been different if Amnesty International had denounced neoliberalism instead of torture. Or even if human rights movements today, in a, like a vast speculative counterfactual, engage not in this self-consciously apolitical and neutral job of naming and shaming uh, and even pursuing minimum entitlements for the poor. Uh, but instead, in offering controversial diagnoses of the root causes, which are economic uh, in this account, of violations, uh, and face down the whole phenomenon. Well, I, I personally doubt it. I doubt that if we removed and imagined different human rights movements that we would have seen different outcomes, mainly because the causal agency starting in Chile and really since uh, has been uh, elsewhere than in these movements. Moreover, to the extent we want to think about this thesis about cause human rights as um, crucial causal inputs or at least agents of distraction from what really matters, we'd need to track that argument way beyond Chile across manifold contexts in space and time. Remember that neoliberalism, if we're starting with Latin America, was not much imposed there in the authoritarian 1970s, but mainly in the democratic and post-transition 1980s and early 90s. More important than this, even for outcomes in Latin America, I'd argue, was the critique of state socialism in which East European dissidents, uh, at least some of them, and their allies uh, in the West engaged after the explosion of dissidents in the 70s. Uh, in spite of some interesting prospects for socialism, even in 1989 in various East European locales, including Czechoslovakia, neoliberalism obviously triumphed there uh, with grim consequences for the endurance of democracy today. But I wouldn't want to be in a position to blame East European dissidents for selectively targeting totalitarianism uh, in the name of international human rights. They were correct, I believe, just as a pure strategic matter, that after decades of trying and failing to imagine a humane socialism under communism, there wasn't going to be a way to establish it until the totalitarian state fell. So the problem there in Eastern Europe was much more how the selectivity of human rights movements encouraged them to remain so intently focused on certain issues after democratic transition, like regime form, the content of constitutions, accountability projects, even as neoliberalism was imposed in these places, mostly by other actors. And insofar, finally, as we ascend to the world level and assign a lot of a blame to international financial institutions for uh, the mostly unchosen uh, experience of neoliberalism in, in so many global locales. Nobody would claim, nobody could on the evidence claim that human rights had any input. In fact, just the reverse. Human rights movements have been spent the last 30 years trying to inject their rhetoric and principles into debates about global economic governance and have barely experienced rhetorical success. So all of that is why I'd, I'd rather pursue not this more debatable approach um, that forces an argument on us about causation or distraction that human rights uh, 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 played. Uh, rather, I'd look down this other path it wasn't the job of human rights activists struggling to invent a new brand of global concern to save the left from its failures in our lifetimes uh, and its mistakes in an admittedly difficult time. Uh, so just as neoliberalism is neoliberalism's fault, so the failure of the left is our fault. And it's hardly fair to treat human rights, even the idea, but also the movements in their name, uh, for adopting 
a ultimately very minor role in world history that they scripted for themselves as scapegoats for the practical reversals of progressive politics. In fact, there's no reason, given this flexibility I've been emphasizing, to think that a human rights that stigmatize superficial abuses like free speech, torture, uh, sufficient provision couldn't coexist with a more structural politics as it did in the era of the welfare state, however imperfectly. So the question would have to be not how human rights failed us, but how we failed to connect them to something more ambitious. If we mistook human rights for the ideology of the end of history, then let's blame not human rights, uh, but ourselves. Uh, and in particular, for not recognizing from an early date the ethical and mobilizational limits of human rights uh, and the need to connect them to other things, as Tomi Nova insisted from the very first. Now, the results, of course, of our mistake has been graphic. Great advances have been made uh, when it came to supranational responsibility and status equality, but at the high price of material equality at every scale. Uh, because uh, human rights lack the norms and movements the desire or will or power to advocate for the latter. Even in theory, just looking at the documents, starting with the Universal Declaration and all the laws that have followed, at best, distributionally, human rights place a focus on that floor of sufficient provision of which Marshall spoke all those years ago without any connection, even notionally in a globalizing economy to a more ambitious material equality. They watched as others like the Chinese built more and more of a floor on uh, a floor of distributional sufficiency, and maybe through various kinds of activism built one themselves. But human rights movements weren't even looking at the ceiling uh, on inequality as neoliberalism blew it away. Uh, deprived of their original ambiance, which others provided, like trade unions and socialist parties of national welfare, human rights emerged in a neoliberal age as weak tools to aim at sufficient provision alongside liberty and security. The political project in their name and the law uh, that it invoked uh, were really a powerless companion of this other project uh, that went on in uh, the achievement of inequality in so many places. So if this is right, we can certainly complain that from the emergence of international human rights uh, as a set of ideals and movements in the 70s, starting with Amnesty International, the second half of the Universal Declaration was forgotten for 30 years, those economic and social rights concerning a sufficient distribution. But I'd complain even more energetically that we didn't notice, even when such groups did gingerly re-engage with distribution, that it was never for the sake of material equality. And it was in the face of exploding hierarchy. The same was true of the star-crossed and mostly catastrophic failure in the realm of the judicialization of economic and social rights, which is a kind of law professor project and judicial project of the last quarter century. Uh, we can complain that it's achieved so little, which it has, but the deeper complaint is that it never envisioned trying uh, because we didn't demand uh, uh, egalitarianism alongside sufficient distribution. So, uh, Material equality isn't something human rights law and movements even set out to defend. And they certainly didn't resemble mobilizationally the kind of activism 
uh, whether socialist or trade union, that had at least forced class compromise in the welfare states in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, indeed, the ascendancy of human rights has coexisted with uh, uh, the death of labor uh, as a, as a live a political force, uh, not the party in this country, though that's also true. I mean, the movement on a worldwide stage. But I hasten to be clear. Uh, I don't mean that human rights cause the collapse of ambition or the disappearance of agents, nor that they distracted from those ruinous consequences. Rather, it's that these limitations should have been obvious from the first. Uh, they were obvious, and we failed to respond to them by keeping human rights in their place and supplementing them with egalitarian politics. So if all this is right, in conclusion, I think we should avoid blaming, let alone ditching, human rights. Rather, our task would have to be to save them from their catastrophic neoliberal companionship as flexible principles that can indeed join a new politics of local and global distributive justice. We would have to indict not human rights, but our poor choices to overstate their ethical glamor and significance. The fact that we overloaded them, so many of us, and I include myself, with practical expectations they couldn't possibly bear, even in the most optimistic scenario. <laughs> That a hammer doesn't turn a screw doesn't mean you blame, let alone abandon the hammer. It just means the hammer was not the right tool for the job, certainly for every job in the first place. Uh, so uh, how do I conclude? The political dynamics of this explosion of material equality have obviously been grievous. Uh, the old voters uh, of labor in the welfare state, many of them are now little Englanders. And in my country, FDR's voters are Trump's. Uh, and so it's not too far-fetched to believe that the explosion of equality uh, in our time has driven the rise of populist leaders. And it's true, they've hardly been friends of human rights. In response, it's been tempting for many to double down on human rights strategies. And I would want to insist it's honorable to do so. It's wonderful that human rights movements are out there climbing the ramparts one more time uh, to indict grim outcomes when regimes slide into evil if they're not there already. To keep hope alive for the most vulnerable and weakest in penury locally and globally. In fact, if it's true that human rights have accompanied neoliberalism, that ought to be named and ought to be a cause of shame. But I wouldn't want to draw the lesson that activists should just stop denouncing repression uh, uh, or engage in informational politics uh, uh, as a very useful strategy. Uh, and they certainly shouldn't withdraw their pressure on behalf of the most abject and miserable. In this country, I, I can, you know, I'm not from here, I'd love to hear what you think, but campaigns in the age of Tory misrepresentation of human rights uh, by just telling us what they are um, have been nothing if not useful. Uh, and yet, uh, I think human rights activists, those who train to do it because they think these principles can save the world, and those even who have already chosen the career and the movement, need to think twice about the neoliberal circumstance in which human rights have defined morality for so many of us. We have to recognize the sh severe limits of this idea and these movements, uh, which uh, have involved our own failure to supplement them with more ambitious visions and progress. Human rights were latecomers to any distributional concerns of any kind, even sufficient provision, and work for it slowly and still very inadequately. <clears throat> 
And since they've gone on to stigmatize only the scandal of material insufficiency turning a blind eye to galloping material equality. In so doing, they miss the point of neoliberalism, which has intensified hierarchy almost everywhere. Um, uh, in taking human rights too seriously, I think the deeper problem, as I've suggested, is that we miss the point of neoliberalism. Human rights activism uh, wasn't neoliberal, but we have been. So uh, what does this suggest practically? Well, I think it suggests the need for new ideologies and movements, not to displace but supplement the, uh, uh, the moral romance of human rights as we've lived it in the past few decades, keeping those movements around for their strictly limited uses but learning to reject the neoliberalism with which those movements have shared the same lifespan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, it will take some time to digest everything you have said, um, but I'm sure there are already questions on the floor. I'll take two or three at a time. Yes. Would you mind introducing yourselves briefly? Would you agree that the concept of humanitarian intervention emerged in an age of increased destabilization and that this concept is only employed by intervening states that stand to gain materially? Okay, thank you. Yes, Nader? Hello, my name is Nader. Um, you, um, I want to thank you for a great talk. You acknowledge that part of the history of human rights is the rise of dissidents in places like Eastern Europe or Latin America, where there were uh, where it was linked with other ideas about democratization and transitions. Uh, but doesn't that complicate the puzzle a bit? That now we also need to ask whether those ideas about democracy, yeah, whether those ideas about democracy and constitutional change or the expansion of civil society or expanding political participation might have also, that there was a limited way by, by which uh, those questions or those ideas were being put forward that kind of, uh, that would have to like force us to, uh, to ask how that is related to social questions or structural issues. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take one more. Yes. Hi, I'm Michelle. Um, Professor Moyne, you make a very convincing argument that human rights uh, did not cause or distract from neo neoliberalism. However, what is its role now in perpetuating and maintaining that agenda through the business and human rights movement in particular, the notion of human rights due diligence, human rights impact assessments, and corporations now utilizing human rights to say that they are in fact promoting the cause of uh, the disempowered. Thank you. Well, these are fantastic questions. I'll just try to answer them briefly in order. Uh, is this working or? I hope so. Uh, okay, um, so humanitarian intervention is, is an old practice and um, you know, its most successful cases are, are ones of South-South intervention in the Cold War. Um, it, it was for a long time in the 19th century before it, it got associated with some unsavory uses in, in the mid-20th, notably with Adolf Hitler's invasions, um, an, imperial, uh, an imperial concept. Um, it really was of main use in, in kind of policing the Ottoman Empire, um, used almost exclusively in the 19th century with respect to whites and Christians uh, suffering, and they were suffering. Uh, sometimes within that empire. Um, I assume you're asking about very recent history uh, and the revival in, in the kind of normal story we tell starting in, you know, the pressures, uh, you know, of, of Bosnia and, and uh, Rwanda and then the, the uh, first, you know, 
a significant such intervention in Kosovo and, and then you know, a few later, notably Libya, um, whether there, A, um, the, the, whether we've, we see great power politics behind them, and that's just straightforwardly obvious, um, I think we, we do. Um, a more contentious question you ask is whether they're unfailingly about the material advancement of those powers. Um, and there I, th I wonder if, again, if, if that most kind of vulgar Marxist approach to thinking about these um, humanitarian interventions is persuasive. So um, I'm not suggesting that that's your view. I'm just suggesting that if we think that we, um, that, that we restrict our gaze to material factors, I think we miss a lot. Uh, so if we take the, the, the idea of humanitarian intervention and later its rebranding as responsibility to protect, um, it's clearly something that draws on you know, the, the, the you know, very honorable interest in protecting human beings to gain consent for great power action. Um, and that occurred in the Security Council through, if not the connivance, then at least the consent of states like Russia and China. Um, and the very fact that they were fooled so badly, or at least said they were after, and then wouldn't allow a further Security Council resolutions for hum humanity's sake in the, Syri in the case of the really much worse Syrian catastrophe, suggests, ag again, that um, th these things aren't, aren't easily traceable uh, to very you know, material agendas. Um, I don't. I, I would find it hard to um, argue that that's, that's unfailingly the case. And the fact that so many people have been not just uplifted, but even in the case of illiberal powers, quite confused about what the other great powers actually had in mind uh, when they moved to humanitarian intervention suggests that there's a lot of mystery. Um, and um, I, I, doubt, I doubt we can say that something like material <coughs> factors are, 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 the, are the, the ultimate cause that explains each aspect of these, of these mysterious interventions. Um, they're quite mysterious now, obviously, because they unfailingly make things worse. So I think we've entered a period in that which they'll mostly not happen because there, there's a pretty broad consensus, I would say, that they we do not know how to conduct them, even if you believe they're justified morally and legally. Okay, now the other questions are, are also wonderful, quite hard. Um, so this book I've, I've tried to summarize very brutally does at least go into a bit more detail than I could here about these very specific locales like Eastern Europe and Latin America. And of course, those were just kind of ground zero for human rights activism in the 70s, and lots of other places have gone through so-called you know, third wave democratization. And then we have to ask, well, what, what do we mean by human rights such that we would assign a causal role to the coming of neoliberalism in each place, mm -hmm. uh, abetted by the fact that in many of them, uh, which are, you know, are, are, are under the thumb of international financial institutions, you have the long arm of the United States or you know, some coalition of outside powers that's forcing results. So the way I would think about it is, is, is first of all, that we can't reach a general verdict. It may well be, um, I mean, there, there are famous cases, um, you know, Cardozo, of people who um, in, had lots of ideological permutations and really did um, often talk the talk of human rights while walking the walk of neoliberal policy. Uh, but how representative of they, in, even in their own regions, let alone globally? Wasn't it much more frequent, if we think about the Eastern European case, that human rights icon served as, let's say, the face uh, of, of, um, of neoliberal policy transitions, which they may not have even understood was going on? So again, we're back to a kind of level of confusion in actors that I think is actually quite central to history as we actually live it. Um, and I wouldn't want to say that someone like Václav Havel w was a neoliberal or was collusive 
in the imposition of neoliberalism because I don't think he understood. First, he didn't want that to happen and didn't understand that that's, that's what went on in part under his watch. If we want to blame someone, we shift to Václav Klaus or you know, people whose ideology this actually was. Now, I also don't think if we raise the level a bit to talk about like constitutions and things like that, well, you know, socialist states have had constitutions. It depends on what they say and, and probably, um, you know, what, what role they play in, in, you know, in, in, in political bargains. Um, and I wouldn't want to say that constitutions are per se neoliberal. That seems just false. Um, it's true, of course, that constitutions are more and more associated with the prestige of human rights, but it's really since 1918, 19 that that's been the case. Um, maybe we argue that the transnationalization of human rights since the, the 70s had some different kind of causal force on constitution making after 1989, and that's a really interesting hypothesis to pursue. But I doubt it leads um, to, to a lot of, of, of causal force in the bargain. Um, I, I, I guess, you know, um, maybe there's some other levels at which we could investigate. I mean, maybe the most abstract, moving from like actual dissidence to constitution making, would be just like the general ideological ambiance. And here maybe the case is strongest that human rights play this role of ideological blinding us. Um, and it's, however, also most elusive to establish uh, at that level. I think if human rights for most people in our age have not been an activist project, but at, at best a kind of weak alibi for what they really knew what was going on or even actively chose in their heart of hearts, which is a particular kind of understanding capitalism, then we blame them. Uh, and we, we learn that human rights can, can be taken more seriously by some people uh, and, and, and adapt to different, different mm -hmm. ecologies. Michelle uh, raises a brilliant concern but again, we say, you know, yes, okay, John Ruggy, my old colleague, uh, has crafted these, you know, principles and so forth. Um, and it's absolutely true that the rise of corporate social responsibility discourse is largely window dressing that um, has, has an obvious, you know, ideological role. Um, human rights are still, I think, a relatively small part of that. John Ruggie's goal and, and the main role of these, of these principles, which are you know, non-legal admonition and so forth, is, to, um, is very narrowly focused as much of the human rights movement has been, but that's another story on kind of atrocity. And again, there's nothing wrong with that um, as, as far as I see it. Um, we'd have to make a really hard argument that the attempt to use this prestigious language to get companies to put themselves on the hook for after the fact or in advance to guard themselves against atrocity has actually worked uh, to, um, you know, causally or at least as some kind of distraction agent uh, to keep other people from regulating them. Uh, for the sake of a broad variety of ends, including egalitarian ones. So I would say that sounds, again, like it, it goes, no one's proven this or it goes further than the evidence I know about would bear. Consider the following analogy. In the era of the welfare state, and then again at, at the hope for global level in the era of the new international economic order, the welfare state or governance goal was to subordinate uh, private activity, including corporations and for the NIO, multinational corporations to <coughs> collective purposes. Uh, and of course, that was rather successful, again, within some version of relatively free market ordering within the, uh, the Western welfare states. Uh, compared to the present, corporations accepted under pressure and because of strong states, a much greater amount of, 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 of redistributive uh, political um, uh, uh, outcomes than they do today. 
Uh, and of course, their multinationalization and its origins may well have been a response to that, that new situation. Mm -hmm. But if that's what we think, then I think we go back to the NIO and say, why blame human rights for trying to stop atrocity uh, when we should think about raising the welfare state to the world level uh, and making corporations not just avoid buying Nigeria in order to you know, kill the Ogoni, uh, but actually serve a global welfare project. Uh, but then the question would be, where's the political coalition for that? I'm not sure attacking business and human rights for its alleged distraction is a main step in the building of that coalition. So the problems are failure to do so. On that note, if I may ask yes. a question myself, um, the second half of your talk was structured by this we yes. that failed to do this and failed to do that. I wanted to ask you more, to reflect more on this we that failed to connect human rights to a more ambitious project. And not only the subject of that we, who is that we that failed to do this, um, but what accounts for the failure itself? Good. Well, this, this is the, the weak point of the talk. I think that you've gotten that at the end of your question. Um, now, look, th this work and, and, in fact, my prior work is a story about elites and elite consensus. <laughs> and if we believe those elites have to fall in the name of some, some other group of people, as if a, an elite rule wouldn't follow in its train, uh, then we pursue that project. Mm -hmm. um, I'm treating elites, uh, the ideological a formation of elites and indeed who gets to constitute them as, as very flexible. Mm -hmm. And if you look across this room, uh, you can't deny this is the case. Now, is it limited? Is it still an elite? You know, and is that who you know, traffics through this institution and mine? Mm -hmm. Undoubtedly. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there's this parse pro toto error that all elites make in saying, uh, and, and of course I've made, without a doubt, in saying that um, there's, there's some way for an elite to advance, at least to some extent, the interests of those outside. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, maybe it's my own, you know, I've tried to, you know, play at least some kind of utopianism, but utopian, but perhaps it's defeatist to accept this constraint. Mm -hmm. um, and. It would be better to, in, in, in an age of extraordinary status equality and inclusion of people from lots of different places at global universities like this one and mine, to, mm -hmm. um, to complain that it's, it's still, there are still projects of elite formation, which of course they are. Um, I, I just think we haven't explored you know, um, what elites uh, have done and could still do. Um, and uh, uh, I, I juxtapose the welfare state for all its faults because at, admittedly under pressure, those elites changed the world. Uh, and presumably uh, that could happen again, even at a greater scale. Now the really hard part of your question is, is to acknowledge that no, no one seems to act for uh, in, aside from writing it down, a distributive ethic, except when there's some s either s scary threat or big movement in its favor. And that's, that's very, very true. Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe that leads us to think that if there's a we, it's one that's yet to be constituted, even if it's going to be led by an elite. But what I don't see is why that analysis would leave would lead us to change the, the, the general terms of the analysis. There, there, of course, is a claim that to be made that our failures in a neoliberal age, um, our failures of imagination and practice, are ultimately due to the, the fact that we were not just living in a, a, a neoliberal political economy, but we were made as neoliberal subjects, as you know, Wendy Brown and so forth would, would, would insist in that way of thinking about, about things. And again, that's, that's quite interesting. Um, I'm not sure that 
it seems as hopeful as I would like um, because it seems much more strategically plausible to me that um, elites in the face of disorder and understanding the injustice to which they've been bystanders could change their minds somewhat. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not sure what, 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 what other role academic in writing in particular that can play than to say that maybe the, the time for that is, if not now, soon. Thank you. Um, yes. Gracie? Hi, uh, my name's Gracie. Uh, I work in the policy team at Liberty. Um, and I was just wondering what you thought about how we might distinguish between circumstances in which human rights are the appropriate frame and should be pushed further or should continue to be applied and circumstances where actually we need a different ideology. Because um, I can imagine that with regard to issues like being forced to take medication against your will or you know the right to die, human rights might be the appropriate framework. But a lot of my work is concerned with migrants and obviously these are people who have been administrated out of the welfare state, healthcare, lawful work and workplace organizing and human rights seems to be kind of the thing that is just about keeping people's heads above water but is also clearly not nearly enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, you've been waiting, yes, for a while. Koldo Kasla, I work for Just Fair and another human rights group for full disclosure. We work for economic and social rights in the UK and it's actually quite good that we go after, after liberty with this question. I, I must admit that I find your argument very compelling, but what, what wasn't entirely clear to me was whether you are critiquing the human rights movement as it is or as it has been, or whether there is something intrinsic in the human rights movement because of its constituency or the tools or whatever that makes it unfit for purpose. You, you mentioned several times uh, Amnesty International, but thankfully the human rights community is much bigger than Amnesty International. We, in, in Just Fair, we are part of a network of 300 NGOs from 75 countries and uh, all over the world that work on economic and social rights and people who are part of these movements, they are perfectly aware of the political economy and, and the paradox of institutionalization of, uh, of, of the gap between human rights capital letter and lower case of Stephen Hopgood. They know all that. They may, know the, they may not know the, li the literature, but they know the challenges. So I, I wonder if you focus too much on the large human rights groups or whether there is hope out there. For instance, in the UK, we in Just Fair, we're working on trying to incorporate class as a protected characteristic in the Equality Act through the social economic duty of Section 1. Maybe the challenge or the lesson from this talk should be let's get more people behind this sort of cause that use the language of human rights, but expand it into areas that have normally been neglected by the, by the big dogs in this community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, one more. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name's Kieran. Um, in, uh, thank you, first of all, for the talk. Um, you were talking about economic and social rights and just just disability, uh, saying that it was a law professor's game, and I'm just wondering if you can expand on that, because uh, in my studies I've looked like at cases like the group boom case in South Africa, which ruled that there was a positive duty on the state to provide housing and to reduce poverty. And I'm just wondering, is that a, is that a good campaign for human rights campaigners to run? Is this something that would supplement human rights, or is this, again, kind of limiting? I suppose as students, we're kind of always throwing criticisms, and it's like, is this a practical solution or not? Thank you. Thank you. OK, so these are actually are all related. So I'll try to start there and, and then return to these two questions. So um, I, I think I was maybe unduly contemptuous of, of, of the judicialization of economic and social rights. Um, it, it, you know, is, it has, was long anticipated once, you know, the, the idea arose and is even you know stated as a very clear agenda in the general comment three of the of the you know a relevant treaty body, um, but then you know South Africa and South African case law became very exciting and taught by law professors the world over, and more important, um, the possible agency of of judges or judicial like figures became a massive cottage industry 
amongst law professors. So it's my, mainly my, you know, sour grapes for having had to read it. Um, but it's very interesting. Uh, but I think the verdict to date um, turns out to be much more depressing than we law professors may have hoped. Um, Irene Grootboom did not get the house, the house uh, before she died that, uh, that she was to which she had a right under the South African Constitution. And more generally, we've found you know, a, a, a real shift in, in, in enthusiasm about this, this South African venue, um, which was once treated as, you know, as you know, unendingly exciting. When we shift to Latin America, where much of the, 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 the jurisprudence and case law is from, we, you know, I think the canniest observers have found that, as we would expect, claiming social rights in court usually presupposes liberty. There's an anti-retrogression norm in, in that same general comment and in, in, you know, in, in human rights law that have, has meant that um, these two factors especially have meant that those who claim economic and social rights tend to be pretty well-off pensioners who are arguing that their pensions ought to remain sacrosanct when governments, including progressive governments, want to shift budgetary priorities. And the, the, the worst off have generally not been helped. Um, even those who have wanted courts to be um, participants in very generous provision under the heading of economic and social rights have been disappointed. So I think what that suggests is that there's a reason why when social rights were consecrated in the 1940s and had after their constitutionalization since 1917, there was no move to, to judicial agency until our time when in general judges were treated as these kind of romantic agents of redemption, which in kind of historical terms is very surprising. They've generally been agents of, you know, the standing order. Um, and that they could be treated as such change agents is just very surprising and, it, and less surprising is that they failed to justify our hopes. Well, what could? I think movements, um, which I, I would be the last one to deny, have moved more and more towards accepting economic and social rights. You know, it really does take the end of the Cold War for that to happen in a big way. States in the global south rhetorically talked a lot about economic and social rights, mainly to fend off um, first world pressure for uh, political and civil rights. Only after uh, 1989 was there anything like, you know, a freestanding economic and social rights NGO and so forth, kind of trying to correct the, the shortcomings of these, um, these original um, movements. So, for a fair adjudication, we would have to get the clock going much further into the post-1989 period than I managed to cover. Full, full admission on that score. The question is, um, are, they, are they likely age, good agents working on their own? Which gets kind of at Gracie's question, what, what, how do we know when human rights are plausible ideologically and practically for, for for the issues to which we might apply them. I'm myself in a, a bit of doubt about um, whether they're, they're appropriate when it comes even to basic provision, mainly because the general verdict is that, especially through judges, but even with movements, we've just not done very well on that score um, in turning human rights in, into distributional tools of any kind. I would want to go further and say that it's pretty clear to me that they're not good, they're not a good frame for egalitarian distribution uh, compared to the movements we have known in history, at least locally, like socialist parties and trade unions, um, which are, are the movements we know, not human rights movements, which have struggled at least for a modicum of material equality. Now, this is, there's a huge debate about this. Um, there's a special rapporteur uh, for extreme poverty named Philip Alston, who in spite of his mandate has issued a big report about how important human rights are 
in, in to mobilize in the uh, inequality crisis. I myself would would come down with the view that um, to the extent we get big movements going for material equality, they will create the conditions and really the only plausible conditions for this actual success in the world of these newfangled uh, economic and social rights movements. It won't matter much at that point whether we include sufficient provision within something called human rights movements or as adjuncts of the bigger cause of distributive justice in general as pursued by things like uh, unions and uh, and and socialist parties and maybe you know bigger entities like the global south which once was an agent aiming in particular at at global egalitarian justice um, migrants is of course a huge topic I'll mostly leave aside except to say that um, human rights law and movements have been uh, you know very weak at at creating inclusionary entitlements for outsiders. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't see that as changing anytime soon. Uh, so to the extent we, we care about this topic, again, we either have to think about a new form of distributional politics locally that is way more inclusionary than the welfare states of the past, or we have to globalize distributive justice so that there's less pressure to move in the first place. In neither of those scenarios do human rights as a concept or a movement strike me as that important. On that note, <laughs> thank you very much for a fascinating talk, provocative as expected, and thank you all for coming tonight. Thanks.